Well, hello, everybody. Uh, we are here in Pleasanton, California, at the Bay Club in Pleasanton. Uh, as you can tell by the setting that we're in, it's, uh, it's pretty comfortable, it's pretty quiet. Uh, the gentleman here to my right uh, need no introduction. Uh, the main reason that we're here is to sit down and visit and say hello and good morning to, to John Ellis, the newest member of the USA Racquetball Hall of Fame. Good morning, John. Morning. Morning, Leo. Morning, Suds. Suds. Good morning, guys. Ellie, thanks for getting outside that desk that you've been yep. working your ass off. Uh, sitting down with Leo and I because I feel it's super important that people hear a little bit about your career. Uh, what you've done, you're going into the Hall of Fame. We know you were inducted during COVID, so you didn't get that opportunity to speak to the people or for the fans and players to really see and hear your story. But it's pretty amazing, and I thought, you know, Leo and I discussed it, and we wanted to be able to sit down with you and just talk about it. Yeah, well, I'm a shy guy, so um, I kind of backed out of going to Houston or uh, Texas for um, 2021, I think, was my induction year. And I just didn't make it there that year. You know, there's a lot going on, obviously, for everybody in, in the country, but... I'm shy too, so I didn't, I didn't, I'm not you know, looking for this attention and having this little speech I'm gonna end up doing today on this court later on, but uh, it's nice to be here, we're friends, we've gone back a long way, so um, you know, couldn't say no, you knew I wasn't gonna say no to this, so uh, let's, let's chat for a little bit. Yeah, you know, uh, John, we'll, uh, we'll get to all that, but uh, really quick, uh, where we're at today. How cool is this being here, what Adam and Bobby and yourself have done? Yeah, I, I didn't do anything with this situation of having the portable court here. It's all Adam and Bobby, the local community, uh, Tri-Valley, which is uh, here in Pleasanton, is their, um, their visitors bureau. Um, and they put in the work. And then obviously the Bay Club here is supportive of racquetball for a lot of years. You know, we're going, let's see, I'm 51, so we're talking like 45 years of support for racquetball. It used wow. to be called Amador Valley Athletic Club when I first played here and I played a lot of matches here when I was in like maybe 10 and on uh, so this has a lot of history it's changed the look of it over the years but they have the portable glass court here and that's hard to accomplish as we know so here we are yeah all right let's let's do it let's uh, let's give the the, the racquetball fans uh, new and old you know let's backtrack man let's go back to the to the old cliche question man when did you first start playing racquetball do you remember the year and, and where sure. it was well you know i don't really remember it for my in my memories but i have these little fragments of memories from the first moments so in 1975 i was three years old uh, my father uh, took his bike and we were riding around university pacific they had a kwanzaa hut there that had a couple racquetball courts two kwanzaa huts had a couple racquetball courts and my uncle had just introduced him to a Dave Apodaca, just introduced Dave Ellis to racquetball. So as an only son, I'm on the back of the bike with him. And next thing you know, we're hitting racquetballs. And those are my first memories from there to the YMCA in Stockton. YMCA led us to uh, Quail Lakes Athletic Club when I was seven years old. So 1979, I was born in 72. I'm 51 right now. So, you know, my first tournament was in Tracy, California when I was five years old. And so uh, wow. let's see the math on that. 46 years of racquetball in my life uh, from a tournament perspective. And, um, you know, it's been a great ride. Well, you know, you started out that young, but let's move into the to the junior uh, sure. career, the competition side. I mean, do you remember your first junior nationals? Sure. Do you remember winning? Uh... <laughs> yeah, I'll tell a funny story, too. Um, so I was seven, it was at Redding, California. My dad heard that the Nationals were there, so he said, well, let's go take you up there and play. There no, no eight and under. I know you had an eight and under, Sudsy, which is, uh, you know, adds to the titles for you as well, but I didn't have that eight and under. So I was in 10 and under that first year, and um, first day there, trying to warm up, day before the tournament starts, you know, I'm nervous, I'm super shy, and my dad's bitching at me, go, go jump on court one, there's a kid on court one who doesn't look too old, it turns out it's Jeff Stark. And so, <laughs> so I, I bust his balls about this all the time, but uh, I go up to the court. Finally, I get the nerve and go up to, you know, can, I, can we play a game? Can I hit on the court? Jeff opens the door, looks me up and down. I mean, truly up and down, right? And goes, nah, man, you're too little. <laughs> <laughs> he was 11 years old, I was seven. Sounds like Jeff. And so, yeah. you know, t typical Jeff Stark fashion, who, by to the way, day. you know, should be a Hall of Famer himself. He's won so much in the age division brackets and is still a great player. But, um, you know, that was a funny first moment. I lost first round there, I won a round in consolation, and then lost in that, and that was my introduction to junior racquetball. My dad was hooked at that point. I guess I was down with it too. Didn't really have a choice as an only child. I was on for the ride with Dave Ellis, and that was fine with me, it was a lot of fun. By the second year, which was Wichita, Kansas, I had won the junior regionals and stuff like that in 10 and under in California, which were big at the time. Sport mm -hmm. was booming at the time. So. 
uh, you know, I went there as the number three seed. They seeded me number three, which I thought was a little ridiculous. Um, even at the time, I knew oh, I probably shouldn't be that. I'm only eight, and so <laughs> I, I remember. Only eight. I remember going to. Eight. I remember going to watch that first round match. My dad was on me about watching it, and we're upstairs looking at the warm up, and I and I wanted to go play and go hang out with friends and play, and uh, he's like, okay, I'll watch and scout scout it. You know, we'll talk about it That's after. Good. It was Mike Locker who won that match. Oh, wow. And so, you know, he's telling me, yeah, this kid's pretty good, you know, all that. Uh, Mike Locker beat me 21-1, 21-0, or it's 21-2, 21-1, something like that. And I got humbled. The very next day, I find myself in a hospital in Wichita for three days. Um, I had some kind of infection in my stomach, and yeah, it was terrible, man. I, had all, <laughs> I, didn't, know, I, wait, I didn't know that. I know a lot about you. I didn't know this story. Yeah, well, you weren't there quite yet. No, so not yet, not yet. I'm in a hospital now in Wichita dealing with that, and um, wow. It was strange. It was a strange weekend. Uh, we stayed in, so we had flown into um, Pueblo, to Denver, Colorado, went to my grandparents in Pueblo and mm -hmm. drove from Pueblo to Wichita and had a third wheel in the back. And that's where we stayed outside of the club in a third wheel. And Jeff Russell was with me at the time, who was, became my first doubles partner. And um, unique memories from that, of course. Uh, and that led me into Carson City the next year when I was nine and finally got more involved and uh, took third place in that one, lost to a kid I didn't beat uh, in two junior matches, never played him again, and, mm -hmm. you know, RIP to him. Mike Altman is who I lost to. You know, crazy enough, you know, Mike Altman was um, on the top floor of the building in Miami that, that came down to the ground, and oh, wow. uh, he passed away. And, it's, you know, makes me sad thinking about it, but he went 2-0 and on me in junior racquetball, so he's someone who sticks out for me. We became friends. I stayed at his house, but... Uh, you know, John Galuli was the guy at the time for yeah. me that we were scouting and really watching. He was the best 10-year-old I've ever seen, uh, probably until you came along, Sudsy. But um, he was a great player. And uh, so I learned a lot, even in loss. I went and watched that finals. And Mike Altman was crowding me a lot in the semifinals. Lost a tough tiebreaker. You know, you know, really, really sad about the loss. Happy I won third. I, I won a tiebreaker for third, blasting Brad something. Brad, maybe the guy from Iowa, the family from Iowa, that, the running, the the running family, the Hanson, Blast yeah, yeah. and Brad Hanson was who I played for third and fourth, and I got that one, but um, went and watched the finals, and, and uh, my dad goes, watch, Galuli will hit him with the ball early. You know, Mike was trying to, trying to uh, crowd him. This is 10 and under racquetball I'm talking about. You know, little rackets <laughs> yeah. back then. Tens. Tens. 250G, I think, was what I was using at the time, and, and uh, Classic. sure enough, about five, six points in the match, Galuli drilled him, didn't say sorry, walked up there, you know, took the ball, and and uh, Altman was never in the way again, and that match was a blowout from that point on. And I learned a lot right there. I learned a, a lot about racquetball and about positioning on the court and what you can get away with and what you can't get away with with good players that you take with you the rest of your life. So um, from there, you know, I can keep talking about every year. When but, was your introduction yeah, to meeting so, this guy in the so juniors? I know he was there in New York when, uh, when I was 10. You were 8. Um, mm -hmm. By the way, we're two years apart, two years and uh, eight days apart. Mm -hmm. um, our birthdays were both Libras, October birthdays. So uh, I won 10 and under in, um, in New York. You won the 8 and under, mm -hmm. so that's cool. We, we're connected by every two years of winning um, those divisions for the most part. I think we, we did that for the most part until you got to 16. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I met him. <laughs> Meeting him was really funny too, so the <laughs> next year... I won 10 and unders in New York, and then we go to... Good um, thing we could edit this, by the way. Yeah. We go to, uh, to Michigan, Flint, Michigan, for the... Flint? 84. Davison. Davison, Michigan. Davison, yeah. And I'm 11 there, lost to Altman again, this time in the quarters, and got blown out, was a little nervous about it all. You know, it's just he was a tough player, but... So before the tournament starts... This little guy with freckles comes up. He's got this. <laughs> you had freckles. Oh, big time. He's got this wicked bowl cut that I'm just giggling at right when I see him. Right now I'm 11, so I'm kind of cool by now. You know, I'm he's a cool kid. My, I'm the young. I'm feeling myself. No, you were cool, man. You came in, you know, balls on him right off the bat. Like, we're gonna play right now. I'm gonna play. Let's get a game. <laughs> Yo, let's get a game going right now. I'm like, you know, I'm looking him up and down, going, man, you're cute. You know, like, as soon as he comes in, he's whooping me around the court, literally beating me in the game right off the bat. I'm like, I'm looking back at my dad, like, this kid's awesome. Um, you know, all the attitude, socks up to here, tiny little shorts on Sudsy. Pretty sure you had Sudsy on the back of your shirt already. already. I couldn't get a sponsorship to save my life at that point. Um, that was my introduction to Sudsy, and, and uh, from that point on, you know, you kind of watch it. I was watching him play. There'd be a big New York crowd around it. BJ Gruba would be there. Um, Spike was obviously there at that time. And, and, you know, you could tell when Sudsy and Jason's matches were on because huge crowd, and mine too, a lot of California kids... Uh, around watching my matches. So that was our introduction. And 
in uh, whatever year that same, was. The same? Do you remember the... Yeah, I mean... What's our, your version? My version is, you know, like, Ellie was, for me, he was a couple years older, but he was the guy, you know, like... When you're in that two years in juniors, you're always looking up, especially if you're, you know, somebody that wants to compete and really get better and be motivated. For me, he was one of the guys I wanted to emulate. You know, I mean, it sounds crazy because he's we're two years old. He's only two years older, one of my best buds in life. But, you know, growing up in the juniors, I wanted to hit it as hard as him. I wanted to roll balls like he did. I wanted, you know, that intensity. I loved it, you know, and, and that's what I tried to do my whole career was take take my favorite players and, and try to copy a little bit of their style that I could use and he had it right away. I mean, I remember, you know, no doubt that historically speaking, Ellie's also one of the most decorated or if not one of the best ever junior racquetball players. And I say that because everybody likes to kind of compartmentalize and mm -hmm. say, you know, who's the best junior? Who's the best amateur? Who's the best pro? And, and I say it all the time and we'll get to it, but, you know, Ellie, there's three ways to get into the Hall of Fame. There's, and you know this, contributor, professional athlete, amateur athlete, and there's no doubt he could have gotten in on all three. Yeah. You know, and hopefully we can touch on that in a little bit. But as a junior player, Ellie was my guy, man. You know, nobody hit it harder. I don't know how he did it, and, and I would just try to hit it harder and harder and harder all the time too. But he was, uh, he was for us, he was kind of a beacon of that's what it is to be a great racquetball player, and California was producing the best, and he kind of led that charge. I mean, I know there was a couple players before you. Sure, sure. But, you know, for, for Jason Menino and myself and guys right around that age, it was Ellie. Mm -hmm. I mean, we live in a, in a different time now, but back then we didn't have the social media and the videos and the text message we could send. So, you know, <laughs> you, you know what, what did you see him in a magazine? Did you see him at an event? You'd heard about him through the... No, I mean, through the great minor. Yeah, we, we as kids, we would look forward to all year. You know, school would be out in June, and we knew that we were going to all see each other and get together for this national event. And, you know, it was, it was very big. I mean, hundreds of kids. Yeah, you know. yeah hundreds of how, hundreds Like, of how many kids were in your 10 I think and under? the first one was seven-something, 700, and you'd have a draw of 40, 50 kids in, yeah. in a draw. Each, each draw would be like that. And yeah, 12 10 under, 12, 14. And uh, so we would see each other, and, and that's where we would see. And then it just clicked. Everything just it would just it would just last for a year you just couldn't wait like we would go home and our friends at home locally couldn't understand the world we were living it was like another world yeah. and you know but ellie was doing that early on dominating hitting the ball different louder than everybody else and and it was just awesome to watch you know all the way through his entire career any any big memories before we move to the pro career for you that stand out in the juniors well l let me let me mention this though because there's you know you're talking about who was ahead of you or the people you kind of looked at and said, yeah, I want to take pieces of their game. You know, clearly Galuli was one of those people for me that I knew I was going to compete against too. But Dave Simonette was the one that really stood out for That's me. Name. Yeah. He got a Burger King sponsorship That's going great. on the cover of National Racquetball Magazine or Racquetball Illustrated, whichever one it was. That was a huge deal. Uh, David Simonette was the guy for me. When I was 10, I watched Cliff Swain play his 16 and under final against Mike Lowe, who I thought was the dopest junior player around. Mike was nice. And Mike was 15, and I thought, hey, Mike's going to beat this guy. He's going to take yeah. him apart. Cliff was dynamic and, and amazing to watch. I said, oh, man, look at this guy. I go, this isn't the same level. And uh, Cliff took him out pretty easy. Mike won the next year against Simonette, so that was impressive for me to see Mike actually get it done. Um, but those two guys, Mike Lowe, John Galuli, Dave Simonette, Cliff Swain, um, Jeff Conine, when we were uh, when I was 12 and he was 18, it was just kind of like this man amongst boys type of situation. Mm -hmm. CBK rocking, and he was hitting harder than basically every pro out there. Not that you know in that time as well. Sure. So you know it's kind of you know you're talking about those people in front of you a little bit, uh, but then it also works the other way. The people behind you that you're Coming keeping up. an eye on, and Sudsy was so personable that he would be like a pinball in a pinball game, gee, 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 <laughs> talking to everybody, whereas Jason's just sitting there as the stump in the middle of the pinball machine, chilling and wanting to talk, you know, normal conversations or different kind of conversations. I would actually talk to Jason a little bit more than Sudsy in a normal conversation set setting. Sudsy might come by me and say something crazy and get me going somewhere, but Jason, would, I would have the craziest conversations with Jason Menino. <laughs> way more adult than they should have been at the time. And um, this is true. I just, Jason just really was intriguing to me as a conversation. I didn't think his game was at that point at that time. I didn't realize how great he would be. Mm -hmm. uh, I found out when I was 18, uh, I was actually 19 at the Junior Worlds. I was kind of doing my, trying my best not to go. Mm -hmm. First Junior Worlds national team for the United States, we were on it. We didn't really have anyone to play besides Fabian Balmori and I think on the 
the girl side, Claudine Garcia was there. So it was just kind of US, a little bit of Canada representation. Mike Green was there, but yeah. wasn't good, quite good yet. And uh, so that was, that was interesting. I show up maybe a, two days late to the tournament. I'm in college. Well, so. well yeah, let, let, let me interrupt here. So, but what I remember about this at the time, now Ellie's about to go be the best player in the world. So he's leaving that out. And that's why, if I remember correctly, you know, he's saying that to go to that event was like, eh, why, well, am, I, why am I gonna yeah, not, not bother bit. so much? But he was, he was winning nationals now. He's now somebody that everybody's looking at as, this, this guy might be the best player in the world, like any second. And I think you were, you know, cause we were pretty tight then. I had, and it was I, almost like, eh, ho-hum for you. I had never went to the Orange Bowl. I went once when I was 14, but I didn't put that's any sock into that tournament like others did, especially East Coast, it was easier yeah. to get to. I was in the middle of basketball season or just getting going into basketball season in high school and didn't really care about the Orange Bowl. Then it became the Junior Worlds. Mm -hmm. So now I'm on the national team, but I'm a freshman at Southwest Missouri State and I'm getting into this other world of growing up. And yeah, I, I was trying my best not to go and Heiser jumped backwards to get me there, which I didn't really want, <laughs> but he did it. And I didn't realize how good Jason Menino was. And at 18, at 19, and he was 16 probably, mate, yeah, I think he was 16 at the time. He played up a level and he just crushed me in the quarters. And that was a good experience to, in terms of learning. Like you can't let, take anyone for granted at any point going forward. And that's one of the things I think that's good about my career and my racquetball personalities. And you're opposite at times. Uh, I give everyone credit for being really good. <laughs> Sorry about that. Wait a minute, wait. We, we, <laughs> but now you need to elaborate on yeah. that. Because <laughs> that makes it's a con It's a different type of thing, you know. It's like um, I just would go into it thinking everyone can beat anybody. Anybody can beat anybody. Everyone can beat me. Mm -hmm. But I'm here to beat them. But I'm going to respect that thought of I could lose this match. Whereas Sudsy was just so seriously confident that it was the, uh, on the other side, like he's coming... He's getting to that mountaintop and coming down. I'm gonna hang out on this side of, no, I'm kicking everyone's ass. That's how it's gonna be. I'm not even gonna let that concept of, I could lose this match. Now that changes as you become a pro and you're in situations where you're playing people 15, 20 times in a career or even that many times in four or five year span, things change. But early on, you know, Jason taught me a lesson on that one. And that's, you know, my personality kind of stayed like that through the years of, of uh, I just think everyone's good. Because if you're better than an A player, you worked hard to get sure. there and do that. And I, I respect that concept quite a bit, that it's that high A level and forward. If you're that, you're a pretty good racquetball player when you think about everyone who's not good at especially, racquetball. Especially then when, when, you know, especially then when the sport was so big and there were so many players, yeah, sure. where those A players like you're talking about then, to me, would probably be high elite players today. Right. And uh, right. I, I under exactly. understand that. We didn't always... Yeah. We didn't always More players. see it eye to eye, and you know we were so close. We'd had in-depth, deep conversations about this stuff, and we would try to understand each other. And I think we do. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, like, let's move from the junior up yep. into the college, adult college. Uh, college. Uh, college yeah, the big. adult college. Yeah. But uh, lastly, though, uh, your your best memories of junior, either a biggest win or biggest tournament, or so what will you remember my, the most about your favorite, junior? My favorite win is a semifinal when I was 15 in the 16 and under. I won the 16s in my low year. That was the only time I won a low year. Um, and I beat Joel Bonnet in the semis. And Joel was bigger than me, taller than me, and crushed the ball. Sponsored by Actelon, the whole works. Yeah. You know, I'm not sponsored by anybody. I'm wearing California style shirts. You know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't have sponsorship till I was 18 years old, mm -hmm. literally. Where, you know, Sudsy, Jason, other guys are wearing their name across the back diagonally on the Actelon shirts. The, yellow the head players have all kinds of dope stuff. I didn't get that. I don't know why. I think it's just one of those things. My personality wasn't, you know, exciting like that. Maybe my game could have that, that style, but not my personality. So mm -hmm. um, everyone thought that he was going to crush me. He was a year older than me, and I, I gave it to him pretty good. And uh, it felt great. It was in Colorado where my mom's from, mm -hmm. so that felt great. Won the finals. Uh, I can't remember who I hooed up. Oh, Galuli. Yeah, played the guy I'm rooming with. And that was an interesting trip for me. Uh, because we drove to um, Denver that year and we stopped in Reno and I did an exhibition there with Galuli. Mm -hmm. Then we stopped in Salt Lake City, did an exhibition there. Then we got to Denver a day or two early and played. So I was totally acclimated to the altitude. And yeah. so that was a huge move as a coach for my dad to do because I was ready to go there. And I don't think Galuli was as ready as I was. Mm -hmm. And also, Galuli liked to 
be in the room before his matches and kind of start shouting out the other player's name and <laughs> F this, F that guy. You know, like, couldn't do that because we were rooming together. So he really couldn't do that. You know, I didn't, took him out of I his didn't routine. Need that. I, was, I was still amped up to play. Um, and so I had beaten him, by the way, in 14 and under when I was 13 and he was 14. I, I made the finals that year by beating Galuli. And he'd tell you it was on a soaking wet court at the Charlie Club in Chicago. And it was soaking wet. <laughs> and I handled it better than him and took him down. And at that point, he was still the man for me. And yeah. so, but, you know, I gave myself a chance. I got housed by Robbie Walden the next day. Uh, yeah, and he was a great player for uh, oh you know goodness. a couple years. He was a really solid yeah. player. Um, but by that, 15 years old, I was ready to get down with it, and I took Galuli down pretty good in the finals there. And that's one of my favorite wins, also. But the Bonnet win was felt great. Um, and I'll say this later today. You know, I remember the losses more than the wins. Sure. Unfortunately, not in a bad yeah, way. Yeah. Like it doesn't hurt deeply. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't make me that emotional or anything. But mm -hmm. if you're a champion, you remember the losses. The wins, 100%. those come and go. You're good with them, but the losses, man, those stick with you forever. Stay with you longer. And so losing to Bonnet in the finals when I was 17, that hurt because now I was, he's really big at this point, buffed Cat. out. You know, he's a man at big that kid. point. And it was 14 and 14 in the finals, so I had an opportunity to get him, and I lost it. You know, I lost it. My win in 18s over Samir Hadid, who we had had a history in California, and not only playing doubles together, but, you know, going against each other. He was really personable, so everyone's always rooting for him, rooting for the underdog as well. And I survived that. That was more just, you know, whew, I survived it. I, it wasn't, you know, I wanted to be in Cancun with my boys from high school partying because we just graduated, right? But I was here in Minnesota, the Junior Nationals, and tried not to go, to be honest with you, but I had to finish out 18s and, and all that. So um, I would say that was just the most, <sighs> it's over now feeling, right? right? And juniors. that didn't help the whole beatdown I got from Menino in, at the Worlds, you know, Five months later so anyways junior worlds yeah that yeah. was you know and remember and just real quick we'll end his junior career here but um for me when ellie was you know i was probably about 13 or 14 and now he's 16 17 you know where that's to me when it was crystal clear that that's what it takes to be yeah. the best player in the world and i think that you know we've talked about it uh kane and i have talked about it jason you kind of see it now it's 16 17 you see who's yeah. going to be what see the separation that's, it starts to happen and for me, Ellie was maybe the best at that separation. And there were some great juniors that went pro. You know, Jack Huzak, Rocky Carson, Jason Menino, myself. But Ellie was one of those for me that was crystal clear. He's going to be the best player in the world and could be the best player in the world. And he just took it different. Everything was different, what he was doing and how he was doing it. And that was when we were kids. And then, obviously, you know, had a pretty damn good career moving forward. All right, so we've talked about the junior career. Now we get to move into... College racquetball, yeah. some people may or may not know, uh, you know, you moved from there. And talk about your college career. Yeah, bit. you know, it was weird. I, I was not sure what I was going to do after high school. Um, I had been getting recruited for some Division II basketball, so, um, there, you know, that was kind of on my mind a little bit, thinking about playing in soccer and basketball at the JC level in Stockton and getting my education going. Wasn't the greatest student in high school, like 2.8 grade point average, you know, felt like I was there to play sports, not, not just go to school. That's... That's on me, yeah. you know, I went to St. Mary's High School and, and uh, at the last second in Houston, I get, I get a call about um, going to Southwest Missouri State and uh, George Baker flies me from Houston to Springfield, Missouri uh, for one day. I'm just, I didn't even spend the night, just mm -hmm. come in and see the campus, offers me a full ride to go to Southwest Missouri State and so, you know, I'm like, oh wow, full ride, you know, so it, it was hard to say no to and, you know, my parents, you know, especially my dad thought it would be a really good decision. You know, he, he uh, bribed me a little bit with, uh, hey, when you graduate, you can get this or this, you know, as a present if you graduate since you're, you know, they'd been saving for me to go to college, I, I assume, and, and uh, they didn't need to use that. So, so uh, I said, okay, I'll go. I, I didn't feel great about it, to be really honest. But when I got there, you know, socially you come out of your hometown environment. Yeah. You got to learn to grow up and learn how to talk and, and get comfortable. And so socially, I had a great time because I think maybe the very first night my parents left, I was at a party at the racquetball house and uh, <laughs> you know, John Kleinschmidt or one of our two racquetball houses there, John Kleinschmidt was throwing a party and said, this is fun. Alan Engel was my roommate. Yeah, lives who, in Missouri now, the John yeah, Kleinschmidt that I know. Yeah, John Kleinschmidt was down there, Mark Isley's there. All these guys are there <laughs> nice. that are players. Nice. Um, yeah. And so, you know, 
Alan Ingles, my roommate, we had played junior nationals against each other in the finals two years prior, and mm -hmm. so two or three years prior. So, you know, he, had getting out, he was getting out of that PRP phase. Mm -hmm. and oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite the transition. <laughs> and so, you know, he's now talking to everybody instead of having to be in a straight line and not talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you know Alan, he's a hilarious dude. So um, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I didn't do great in school, um, but uh, I had a lot of fun. I only lasted a year and a half because my, my grades were horrible. And so that's on me again. <laughs> but uh, getting down there was interesting. You know, there was so much competition in our practice. We had great players. Who Tim some Sweeney of those was the number yeah. one. He was the defending national champion. They had won the championship, the national championship as a team before taking it away from Memphis the year before we got there. And now we're recruiting in myself, Alan, Heather Dunn, Jenny Spangenberg, all the same grade. So we're coming with even more. Mm -hmm. And um, Tim Sweeney's there, although he's a man amongst you know, growing adults, but he was a man already. Uh, Brian Rankin, Simone Wah, Derek Robinson, oh, Buzz yeah. Sawyer, uh, Bruce Erickson, myself, and, and go on, you know, Billy Perone, one of my boys, Beeps. And uh, so, turns out, I'm not as good of a practice player in terms of winning <laughs> matches that are for the ranking on the team. And I end up winning, uh, making number fives. I was sitting at number 12 on the team for a little while. And then the That's coach goes, wow. literally, the coach goes, hey, you got to win some practice, you got to win some challenge matches here to make the team. And I'm like, yeah, I see that. I see that. So I went on a little streak of challenge match wins, got myself into the number five position and went to the nationals. My mom came out that was in Canton, Ohio. And uh, as part of a team that completely dominated the, the deal there, I think we swept everything wow. at Southwest Missouri State and I won the number fives. Oh, and uh, number two doubles with Billy and um, had a great time. My mom was there. So it was special from a different perspective just because my dad wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And it was my mom who came to see it. And, you know, we're in college now. And, um, but back at, back, at the, back at the school, you know, it was just, it was interesting kind of knowing when to be in the middle of all the, the moments, especially Sween's, you know, and his tight click and when I need to jump out of that for a second and be in my own head, in my own world here to prepare for different things. I will say that I won a lot of the money at the tournaments that had money in, in, in Kansas. You know, it was Sweeney and I quite often in the finals of those, even though I was number five on the team. Because I was used to playing for money in California mm -hmm. uh, during my high school career. And a lot of matches with Bromfield, Mike Lowe, Scott Oliver, Jerry Price, who, by the way, those two guys are my favorite racquetball players of all time. Um, Jerry Price so, here this weekend. Yeah, GP's playing. here this weekend. You know, Sudsy's close to GP big time. You see Scott, I'm sure you have great conversations with him as well. But, but uh, yeah, so I, I didn't really care about the practice wins. I wanted to win the money in the tournaments. And so that was, I knew I was getting that pro mentality going as well. And, you know, of course, we went, you know, weird, a weird thing happened my freshman year. Um, we went to national doubles in Phoenix. Eric Mueller's my partner rolling over from 18s. We're going there to win the, the 19 plus. Mm -hmm. Everybody from the IRT who's ranked high drops out because they're becoming just pros. They're having this little moment. And so we look at the draw together the day before and go, well, everyone's gone. A couple good teams here and there. I think we can win this too. And so we ended up winning both 19 plus and, and, uh, and the opens, which that changed it for me. That went, okay. I know I'm at this level with this secondary group of guys. Mm -hmm. Here's this other group over here. And by the way, that other group doesn't have Cliff because Cliff's now up here again, sure. away from that group a little bit. So um, that was a big moment for me. Uh, later that year, I went to the Nationals. Again, I'm coming off about a month earlier, winning the number fives in Collegiate. And I make the finals of the Nationals. And everyone's seen the match with Chris Cole, where I, apparently I skip a ball in the tiebreaker on a serve that really mattered. Mm -hmm. I skipped a serve that was big. Um, loss of tiebreaker to Chris Cole. You know, again, another guy I'm connected to in rest racquetball, in peace. rest in yeah. peace. Yeah, you know, very sad that he passed away. Uh, but we had a legendary match that has a lot of views online with that one. And I look, you know, I've got hair everywhere. <laughs> you know, I'm with Richcraft at that time, wearing all black. I'll be, I'll say this right now. I was definitely the first player to wear black socks and rock that because people were giving me shit the whole time I was rocking mm -hmm. it at Houston. But I was on top of what the Fab Five was all about. Jordan had lengthened the shorts. Fab Five took it to another level, and Michigan. they had the black socks. And I was like, that's dope. I love the Fab Five, right? I mean, Michigan was my squad at the time. And so I brought that over and rolled that to her. So there's no doubt about it. I'm the first to wear black socks and racquetball and start this. Now we all have that's, awesome socks. That's a real reason why he's going in the That's all that matters, owning. really, to me, is the style game at that point. Had the Richcraft going. Mm -hmm. um, played with some crazy rackets in the Richcraft days. But then they got kind of good, you know, yeah. the rackets got kind of good. 
Uh, from that point, <clears throat> that kind of rolled me into going to Pro Kenix, which is who I played the majority of my professional career for. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, doing well at Houston led to that, to that sponsorship and relationship um, that allowed me to play the tour, to be quite honest. And once again, playing with some crazy rackets there in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Remember that one that looked like a bear shoe there for a little while? Yeah. Let, let's, 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 yeah, you know, we, we, we hit that college career a little bit. Um, just give, give us a quick, you know, the highlight reel of your amateur career before that transition deep yeah, sure. heavy into the pro. So I lost to Cole in, in 92, uh, go 93. Mm -hmm. I'm losing to Sweeney, who now we have this relationship from school. Um, I'm losing in the semis pretty bad to Sweeney in game two. He crushed me in game one. And I remember this match. I, I mean, I, I'm, wow. Yeah. When, they, when you talk about, when great athletes talk about having a moment where they lose themselves within their self, mm -hmm. I, I did. I didn't know, I didn't feel anything. And I just started mocking drive serves everywhere. Sweeney's couldn't get any of them. Came back and won game two in a comeback and then dominated game three. And it was, I didn't know where it came from because it was crazy that I was serving that well. But rolled that over, so that's that's one of my favorite. That's my favorite amateur win. If you could find that match online, I mean, I was sitting outside watching. I remember and watching you do that, and and Sweeney's at the time, Tim Sweeney, you know, arguably was the hardest hitter on the planet. Yeah, he had you won know, the nationals the year before. All the time, he just or won the nationals. Two years before, two years before, he was he a won physical it. specimen. He, you know, he walked in, and Sweeney's isn't a, a loud, rambunctious guy. You yeah. know, in public, we right. know him personally. Yeah. Um, but he just had a demeanor about him. Yep. Like, like he, you know, you just didn't want to bother him. You know, he's not a big overpowering. Just, yeah. just well, he'll, a wrestle, tough, he'll wrestle you down the ground. Yeah, and put you, yeah. You know, approachable. Tough, pro tough, confident, comfortable. And, like, yes, Tim Sweeney's not going to lose. Yeah. You know, almost a similar, like, Kane effect. Super Sweeney's confident. doesn't lose. Yeah. And, Ellie, when you did that, man, now we're friends at the time. I was a fan. I'm like, holy shit. And I, we will never be able to explain it. Like words won't explain as, as well as you just kind of talked yeah. about it. But you know, you talk about zones and athletes talk about zones, but Ellie even said it different. You know, he, he just got lost. He didn't know where he was. And at, wherever he was, it was the best player in the world in that moment. I don't care who, the, who his receiver was. I mean, it, and he said mock, I don't know if you picked that up. He said he was hitting drive service mock speed. It was just different. And you know the court in Houston, Texas. Oh, yes. You know how fast Absolutely. that court is. Uh, I've never seen anything like that. I mean, we see great service today. Kane, you know, Conrado, Cliff, uh, Jake, Bredenbeck. That moment, that game and a half was something out of this world. Yeah, yeah. Was that, do you think, That's, the, that's that my moment? favorite amateur win <laughs> just because, um, you know, Tim, I had already beaten Tim a couple times, so it wasn't that I was you know, didn't think I could beat him or anything like that because he was all that. Two years prior, he had won the Nat he'd beaten Tim Doyle, who was one of the higher-ranked pros, yeah. and Pronin. they just were unbelievable drive-serving from Sweens himself. Um, so, you know, it was, it was crazy for me to uh, have that moment and then, um, you know, go on to finish it with Michael Bronfeld, a guy who I had played, probably, I probably played Michael Bronfeld more than any other player in my life, um, including Cliff and Sudsy, who I think are number two and three for me in terms of the amount of matches I played against one person. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, finishing that off, getting it done pretty easy in two. Lost to him the next year. You know, that unfortunately, I thought I was, could go back to back. Didn't get that done. He beat me. He found his inner, inner tiger, inner zone. And I thought I was going, I was up 7 4 in game two after dominating game one. And then he let out this scream that came from his soul. And I went, oh, that's interesting at the moment. But I th still thought I was going to win. But it was the first moment I said, I'm going to win this match again. I'm going to go back to back. That didn't happen after that. He played great and beat me good after that. And then it culminated a couple of years later in, in 95 or a year later in 95 in our last, our, not our final match, but our final amateur match at the Pan Am Games in Argentina where, you know, lucky enough, I get to say, uh, well, you were the first. There can only be one first, and that's you and Sweeney because you guys played before me that day. But I'm kind of there with you. We're the only, there can only be one first time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's Sudsy and I when it comes to, and Sweeney's, when it comes to the Pan Am gold. Mm -hmm. And so we finished that match off in an 11-10 tiebreaker that was, I literally didn't leave the court for an hour after S sat down. because yeah. people wouldn't let us leave. It was packed. They, it, they just, w they were so frenzied because it came, became such a great match that they just lost their mind out there and they wouldn't leave the area and we couldn't get Stayed out. in the court. They were just, There's I mean, imagine this here behind court, it yeah. and it's just going way up and you just, they just won't leave. They're just standing, clapping, you know, the whole time. and. Wow. I just sat there and just chilled for a while because I was exhausted at that point too. There's a lot. There's a lot going on to get to that point where you're you're the first Pan Am team, 
you know, it's emotional, you, you're, you're there, we're sweeping it, so we're doing what we came out to do. I was watching their doubles matches going, man, these guys are hitting photons. Sweeney and Sudsy were hitting the ball as hard as anyone's ever hit the ball in those matches because they were, they were using each other to just be amped. They were totally connected the whole time, like a marriage, literally. I barely saw them outside of the court, but I was watching their matches, and so they were getting me fired up to play my matches. I almost lost the semis to Sherman Greenfeld, who's a great player. Yes, you know, he is. Really difficult to beat. He had beaten me the year before in the trials, which you were not the trials. Yeah. He had beaten me the year before, and you know, he basically wore me out. I sweated out in the semis the year before and didn't mm -hmm. make the final. And he was about to do it again. And then he made a mistake and tried to crowd me. Oh, oh, oh. And I hit him with the ball. One of the hardest I've ever I, seen. I squeaked out game two. Good coaching from, from Jim Winterton, Fran Davis. Yep. Helped me squeak out uh, game two. And game three, early in the game, he tried to crowd me a little bit, and I hit him as hard as I possibly could. And that mark's still I wasn't there. trying to hit him, but I wasn't trying not to hit him. And Taking he, he well I, said. Yeah, but you know, a little bit more on the. I'm trying to hit him a little bit yeah, too, yeah. Um, because I was tired of him crowding me a little bit too. Yeah, and he's very, uh, yeah, he's, well, he's like a spider. He's just on me. You know, a spider just keeps sticking. Like where you keep coming yeah, back off, from? Yeah. Get off me! I brushed you off. But he, you know, he was a great player too. So um, when I hit him. That affected him big time, blood gushing out of the leg. He oh, literally no. didn't play for third and fourth that day later on Which because was he important. could not walk yeah. anymore. No, he got him. So LA Derek got him. Robinson, you know, he gave me some love because Derek didn't have to play for third or fourth. <laughs> and that was right. the, that completed, That's how sweat. That completed the sweep. That's right. I think Derek would have beat him anyways yeah. if they played because Sherman yeah. couldn't move anymore. Um, but when we got done winning that and it was all over, we fly back on the worst flight we've ever been on. We're literally scaring the shit out of Sweeney before we take bad. off because <laughs> it was bad. thunderstorm, lightning, the whole works are going on. One Sweeney's, of the worst I've ever been on. Sweeney's is really scared. He had had some, some, some deaths in his life, yeah. you know, with, with dad, close, re, his dad close re, family re, members, re, girlfriend, re, dad along re, the way. So he's, you know, I'm sure contemplating that. We're the jerk buddies of his that are just like, but if it's time to go, it's our time. It's our time. We I think he did. actually said that, like dead yeah. serious. Yeah. It, it was bad. Well, we were dead bad. serious and kind of messing with Tim a little bit too. But we've done everything we came to do. We just got this done, buddy. And he was freaking. We're time, you know, we're doing the buddy voice. And, uh, but it was a scary flight home. We yeah. get there, we're in about five o'clock in the morning. We Miami. get to Miami. Land in Miami. We're looking at the board saying, okay, you're going here, you're going here, you're Chicago, going here. Chicago, New York, California. We looked at each other and what, what, what the F are we doing here? We're in Miami. Let's go to South Beach. So we end up staying four more days in South Beach right there. Three of us. Having a great time. Celebrate. Yeah, yeah we did. We Gold did. medals in our bags. Yeah. The first ones. There can only be one first one. You know it. So um, since then, thankfully, the sport's been in the Pan Am Games for yeah. a number of years because the cool thing for me is Adam Karp, who was living with me in Stockton in 99, uh, four years later, he won the singles. So That's him crazy. and I, for a second, had both singles That's titles. Crazy. The first two were residing in one household, and we used to love each other because of that. You know what I mean? So, um, um, but yeah, that was, uh, those, were good, those were good amateur moments, and from the 95, I then went professional from there and was done playing the amateur stuff for a while. And that was tough because at the time, we used to have to send in our IRT paychecks. Let's, to let's, let's cut right there. <laughs> yeah, so before we, we get into that, we, we, you know, the, 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 the amateur and the juniors probably aren't as well documented and found. So, you know, thank you for sharing all those moments. Some of those things we'll probably never be able to read or see about. Uh, but if anybody out there does have any of those old tapes, uh, uh, any kind of media, you know, please reach out to uh, Sudsy or, or John or myself, and we would love to get that stuff out there I've, for you people to see. I've said this before, Leo. I've, I've never seen any of the finals, any footage of the finals at all. Never seen any of it. Of I've seen the, a photo. Uh, I've seen a couple photos the of the moment. Yeah, mm -hmm. the Pan Am Games. Never seen any footage. So I don't know if it exists. But if it is, they're sitting on it for 28 years now, and I'd like to see it. So if that could happen, I mean, yeah, yeah, look around a lot. And, uh, if you've got that. Um, and then now, um, let's uh, get into the pro career. I mean, some of it is a, a very well documented. Uh, you know, there's DVDs and YouTube videos, but we still want to hear when you left that junior and amateur and then moved in yeah. to the pros. Yeah, you know, I was 93, year and a half at school. So 93, February 93 is my first stop in Atlanta as a full-time pro. I had played a couple other stops prior to trying to qualify. Uh, it, you know, it took me six or seven times to win a match, mm -hmm. opposite of your situation where you're winning a tournament in your second or third one ever, or whatever it was in, in Portland. Opposite for me, I ran into Drew Kotschnik a couple times, and he wasn't just gonna let me win. And he's now, next thing you know, I'm getting beat up on the court, and I 
you know, I was ready for it, but just wow, like wow. And I had seen Drew play as a junior, but now he's full grown. And you know Drew from Texas. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's Elbows crazy. Elbows in the back. And then the other four first rounds are Cliff Swain. So like, you know, the first Cliff Swain match was in Vegas. Front wall glass, right side glass. He's hitting Z serves. I can't see him. I literally can't see him. And he made it, oops, he made it a point to make sure that I wasn't going to get any head start on getting to him. So he knew what he was dealing with too. So, you know, I respect that, you know, because it took such a long time to get a first win. Last, se- last term of the season, Nationals in Seattle. I beat Mike Yellen. I'm Mike Yellen's last match. He was the only guy that was a little bit mean to me. I won't get too much into that, but mm-hmm. I was happy that it was Yellen for my first pro win as a full-time touring pro and his last match. I, you know, what a, what a legend he is, sure. you know, all the winning he did. He's uh, one of the greatest of all time. So um, that was great. But that then got me going for the next season where I started to make a little bit run at, at some ranking points and getting better and winning matches. So it was tough to get into that though. I mean, it was, you had a lot of veteran United States players and players from Canada who were, who were solid players and um, they didn't just want some kid coming in and winning matches and you know, hey. Yeah. That, yeah, that, that group that he's talking about was really good at that. You know, they, they wanted to make sure, probably led by Cliff, you know, yeah, in that charge sure. of, uh, we're not going to let this kid come in and John Ellis is, is the hot new thing and people talking about him as the best player in the world. You know, they, they made sure to say, well, we're still the best players in the world and you're going to have to earn it. And, you know, fast forward and obviously he certainly did. So you talked about your first win against Mike Yellen. Uh, going forward. Yeah, so the next thing that stands out for me is um, international racquetball tour. So now we're playing a tournament in Mexico. My dad, I know I was a little unsure about traveling. I know he couldn't this travel with me. This is the pro tour going pro to tour. Mexico. Pro tour, IRT stopped in Mexico, I think the first one. And um, Hank Marcus, our commissioner, decides not to go. And so Tim Doyle is the acting commissioner while being a player. So I'm <laughs> right off the bat, I'm going, this is strange. And uh, my dad, God, this was a rough one. He decides to get me a ticket into Mexico City. From Mexico City, I go to go from airport by myself, 20 years old, 21 years old, maybe. I'm 20, maybe 21 at this point, but I think only 20. Mexico City airport, get in a taxi and go to the bus station with, I was traveling with too much stuff at that point. I was a rookie, so I didn't know how to pack quite yet. And so I'm <laughs> traveling to, which was you know, an art. too many bags. I'm five foot five, so bags are huge on me sometimes. It's annoying. And so I go get in a taxi, get it to the bus station. I don't know Spanish that, as well as I do now, and I don't know Spanish that well, but I could say some words now. Mm-hmm. I could get some sentences out. And I bus station, overnight uh, bus drive, six hours to San Luis Potosí. Wow. And so I show up there. <laughs> Cliff and Doyle are sick already because they, eat- they yeah. immediately were eating everything. They rented a car, got pulled over three times, got rid of the car. <laughs> They're both pooing and throwing up Coming everywhere. Out yeah, yeah. Doyle and Swain. They, they lost I'm like, a lot and so them. you walk in and you're like, wow, what are, we, what are we getting into here? But there was enough of us there where we had an awesome time and um, the club was great, La Loma mm-hmm. uh, Racket awesome. Club. And the people there were great. I made my first final there. Lost to Cliff in four, so mm-hmm. it wasn't like I just you know, gave it to him. You know, I battled him in that first final. I think the ceiling was a couple, couple feet too low mm. and so it was a different court you know what I mean it's not a lot of glass or anything at that time not the clubs that are in Mexico now which are some of the best clubs in the world Beautiful, yeah. um, so that got me going on trying you know starting to get going on winning pro matches and getting deeper into the draw um, yeah so that was the first thing that what year, stands out what you, what you I want to say 94 93 94 okay. you know somewhere in there maybe the end of 93 maybe early 94 I'm not sure what were some of the highlights of your of your pro career as far as not necessarily maybe just wins, but finally beating, you know, this player or that player? You know, obviously you you know, you ran into, you know, Suds yeah, and Jason. Sure. You know, who were those big well, mo- what were those it, big moments? Again, it's hard to stand out with the wins because I don't really think about them a lot. You know what you I mean? Let's talk I mean, about the losses. Yeah, so you know, the losses, um, my record against Cliff is horrible. Seven and thirty one, something like that is what I saw on Todd's site more when you factor in the um, satellite stops that aren't in there because he was awesome at satellite stops even if we were drinking <laughs> Saturday night he'd wake up and play phenomenal awesome I couldn't score a point in satellite stops in, on Sunday because we'd probably go out drinking on Saturday because that's satellites back then were about we want to see good racquetball up until Sunday then we want to take you out Saturday night and show you our, our town and show you how much fun we are and of course we were on board for that you sure. know, especially I was single early on so it was it was all good on that part and so um and there's more losses to Cliff, but you know that stands out. Such a terrible record. But 
I did beat him seven times, and most can't say they even beat him once. So, you know, I got, after the first 0 for 13 run, and then I finally beat him, when I finally beat him. Where was it? Uh, in Rochester, in the quarterfinals, and, and three straight, real easy. After the match is over, Cliff, <laughs> Cliff on the court, you know, comes up, we're about to shake, I'm looking to shake his hand, he just grabs the top of my head and gives me a noogie <laughs> for about three seconds, you know, and I saw the look in his eyes. He was, he was ready to not compete at the highest Cliff Swain level that day. And that, you know, and I saw it in his eyes early and said, oh, I'm going to win this one. He's, and he was ready to let go and say, okay, you know, you're good enough to beat you. I wasn't ready to play it. Generally speaking, he probably had an injury going on that he'd never talk about because sure. that's how he was, and, uh, which I really admire. And um, so, you know, I got that first win. That stands out a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, Losses-wise, you know, my record against Jason in pros is pretty good. I think I have a winning record on him. But when you come down to the finals that we played each other, I'm 0 for 3. 11-9 tiebreaker in all three. Mm. His first pro finals win was against me in Rochester. And so, you know, you think back, I think back about that, not the 13 and six or seven record, what I ha whatever I have against me. And I'd rather have Jason's career as a pro. US, two US Opens, number sure. one in the world yeah. during a tough time. But I have that winning record, so at least I've got a little bit there going on. But, you know, I'd rather have Jason's career. Um, Sudsy's, Sudsy and I's first pro match was hilarious. Atlanta, I'm already two years into it. He's just getting going. I take a call, whether it was me cheating or not. I don't really care at this point. This is pros, buddy. Get used to it. And he's like, oh, so that's how it's going to be. Almost turned into Jason. So that's how it is, huh? That's how it is. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we're, be we're best. Back. I'm we're getting ready to be yeah, the back end. Yeah, yeah, we're Slop, serve, or some crap. And... Uh, Yes, but this is how yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, that, that was, you know. And that he, was probably a waking up moment for you. 100%. You know, we talk about lessons. You've talked a lot about that, about learning moments. You know, we're best buddies at the time. I mean, super tight, you know, <laughs> learning that we're going to be competing against each other, you know, and, and I, he taught me a lesson there because I was pissed. I, like, I wanted to fight him, I think, in that moment. I was really angry because I felt like he was cheating me. Mm -hmm. Little did I know what was to come, yeah. you know, dealing with the guys on tour. Yeah. Because I, I wasn't full time yet. No, nope. you, know, you were starting, you were getting going, you were getting I was ready just to just kind of touching, going. scratching the surface. Yeah. And I want to mention something about that too, by the way. But yeah, it was, it was a big moment for me because here he is, he's one of my best buddies on tour, and I think he's cheating me, which I now am the biggest preacher of it's not cheating. And uh, yeah, but he told me just like that, yeah, that's how it is. Like, that's how it's going to be. I had played Cliff seven, eight, nine, ten times already, whatever mm -hmm. it was. Um, so, yeah, tell the story real quick about, about Portland Jack because Portland. I think that's, yeah. that's fun. So, <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to hear your version of this, too. Set the scene. So we, we go to Houston for the Nationals. Uh, I'm, I'm in, and I lose to Michael Bromfeld in the quarters, and I, and I think people thought I was going to be a decent player at the time, you know, young junior coming sure. up and probably was expected to actually do something there in Houston mm -hmm. that year mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And I get to the quarters. I don't remember who I beat to get to there, but... Bromfeld kicks the shit. I mean, he kicks my ass. Remember that? It yeah. was like, I mean, it, Surprised I really, me a little bit. I want to say it was like 13 and 7. Yeah. Like, it was a beating. And I'm just angry and, you know, cranky. And Ellie is at the Portland Pro Nationals. Uh, or, or going. You yeah. were there. He was already there. No, I was there. getting ready to go. Yeah, he was going to... there. And I'm in, I'm in Houston. And I'm going home. And we're super tight. I'm 19 years old. He's 21. He's already on tour. And I'm just starting to get going. And I remember his words vividly. He's like, you come coming to Portland, right, to the Pro Nationals. You're in the draw. I, th I was going to be ranked 11. It was uh, in June in, in the Multnomah Athletic Club the weekend after Houston. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, man, you know, I, I don't know what I want to do. You know, I just lost to Michael Bromfeld, you know, in the quarterfinals. And he goes, he goes hey, if you're going to play professionally and you're going to be a pro, you got to come to the Pro Nationals. And I'm like, yeah, he's right. Little did I know. He just wanted to hang out. He just wanted me there to, to be buds and hang out. He didn't want to be alone, you know. That really, I was young still. I was still we were, young. We were young. And we were friends, and we wanted to hang. And yep. He just wanted me there. and he, You know, it, it was something that was a huge part of my pro career that not, not many people know. Like, he got me to that tournament, and I wound up winning the Pro Nationals after losing in the quarterfinals <laughs> to Michael Bromfeld in the yeah. 19, and I go win the Pro Nationals, and, and it was really just to go hang out with my buddy. Yeah, and the sad thing for me is I took off, I took off after, uh, like maybe on Saturday night or Friday or Sunday morning early, I think I left, um, so I didn't see the finals. Um, you know, with, by that point, I was like, God, he's in the finals. This is just <laughs> nuts anyways. Um, but you had to think Drew was probably going to win that match, but uh, not even close. And, um, you know, Drew was that good where he was a veteran and he was there. He'd beat yeah. Cliff in the semis. It was, like, it was awesome. 
And uh, Sudsy, Sudsy took it to him. And so at that point, you're going, well, shoot, man, he's got the first out of our group. He's got the first pro win. And so here, you know, here he goes. His, his career is off and running. And so now with flip-flops, just like that, now I'm chasing Sudsy. Um, I mean, that's the way it ended up being the whole time. I mean, in my record against Sudsy, I'm very proud of the 10 wins I have against you on tour. Um, but, you know, it's 10 and 20-something. And so, um, you know, that goes on to what I'm talking about. You know, you remember the, the L's more than the W's at times. And I have, I have a losing record to a couple people. Um, it's Cliff, of course, Sudsy, maybe one or two other of the veterans out there as well. Um, you know, professionally, I never got a chance to play a couple of players that I wish I would have. I never played Brett Hardnett in singles. Mm -hmm. I never played Jack Newman in singles. I never played um, um, big guy from Southern California, Ed Andrews. Never mm. got a chance to play Ed Andrews. You know, in Sudsy and I's years, we kind of are that gap, you know. We're that gap from the OGs of racquetball, Hogan and all of them, into even Brumfeld, era. into you know, the Rocky Carson's Jack Cusack, well, our, our, our era is in the middle of that, right? And so we saw, we started with little rackets. Players nowadays, they didn't start with little rackets. They no. started with 22 inches. Sure. So they're smooth with their swings. You know, and one thing, you know, as I was a teenager and into my pro career, I, I got seduced by power, by the length of the racket and the explosion that was happening with the ball and the racket. And, um, you know, that was a huge part of the pro game, blasting serves at that point, too. And, and so many powerful players, Andy Roberts, uh, Cliff Swain, and others that were great. And then you had your control players in Ruben Gonzalez, Mike Ray, Drew Kostick was more of a control player, I would yeah. say. Uh, retrievers that were unbelievable. So, you know, we had both sides of the spectrum that we were involved with. So, you know, suddenly getting that win was huge, and that just opened the door to the concept of winning. And, so, okay, let's fast forward to 95. I win the Pan Ams, so we're coming back now. He's already won multiple stops at that point. Um, I'm not sure if you're ranked number one or no. two, three, or somewhere yeah. in there, right? I wasn't and I'm, I'm probably ranked in the seven, eight range at that point. And uh, so we get to the finals of, of, uh, of Negretti's stop in Chicago, which is my favorite tournament of all time, is the Chicago's the Halloween stop, Classic. The yes. Halloween Classic. Yep, yep. Um, the year before, I think we weren't in the final, so we were raging at the party on Saturday <laughs> yes. night. I mean, we were literally standing, dancing on the bar, standing on the bar, yeah. dancing, yeah. drinking, having a good time. Bar the in year, the club, old school. The next year, we're in the finals against each other, and I could just tell by the way he was talking to me, he wanted me to win the match. He literally wanted me to win the match, and I know that might not be great for you because, hey, you think back about those things, but I think it doesn't matter to you because you won so many times. But I could feel it that day. Weird little situation. He grew up with Ruben. Ruben's somehow coaching me for a little bit and so it was really weird to have Ruben coaching against you and I thought I'm in the middle of going I don't want to be in this triangle right this is weird but I'm I'm taking Ruben's advice because you know dudes dudes won some stops and is a legend and and plays well you know that was one of the things and has a cool mentality for it. we I gotten to know him a little bit better and so um yeah I won that match in four he killed me the first game and then I could see him starting to want me to win bitching at the ref like don't just give him his first win. I'm like, you're giving me my first win. It's great. <laughs> and I was done for it. No, I didn't. To, to be, yeah. I it. mean, I played okay. I played pretty well. Um, and he'll say, no, he didn't. But in the end, in his soul, he was ready for me to get a win as much as I was ready to get a win. I had flown one of my best friends out there, Aaron Mata, to watch, them, to watch the quarters on. Mm -hmm. So one of my best friends in life saw live my first win. And so that was great. Um, I guess I've won eight stops and one double stop. Uh, the two wins that stand out to me the most are when I beat Sudsy and Cliff in a semi and final. And it's one one way and one the other. Riverside semis for me, Sudsy, battle five gamer, win in three games against Cliff in the finals, which is shocking to me that I won in three games in the finals. And then Denver later on, my grandmother just passed away. And now we're in Denver, and you're staying with me at the house at that point, at, at my cousin Becky's house all those years. And so, That's when we still stayed together. Yeah, we, you know, we, were, we were housing there, and, and um, I had beaten Cliff in a tough five-gamer in the semis, and then Sudsy and I had a four-gamer, and that was a good match. I, unfortunately, I hit Sudsy with a follow-through backhand right on the face and rocked you a little bit with that. And so that, you know, I think that discombobulated you a little bit in the ending of the match, and I was able to take it in four um, because I got you pretty good on that one, you know. I felt really you bad just about better, that. Man. You just won. Yeah, you know, I was ready. I was we always ready to played play tight. Again. We were always yeah, each we other. Yeah, we had some good matches. Uh, you know, you blew me out a, a handful of times as well. I never blew you out once, but uh, Atlanta just the first one. But that didn't count. But you blew me out a couple of times, you know. Uh, but we had some really, really good matches as well. Um, most of the great matches he won, I won a, maybe one or two of them. Um, so. 
Uh, you know, I don't even remember how I won 10 matches against you, to be quite yeah, honest. It, it was hard. I mean, people ask all the time, like, who's your, you know, who's, who's your toughest rival or your toughest um, opponent for me? And everybody thinks Cliff right, right. away. And then, like, that was easy. You know, Cliff, because we weren't really super close, Cliff and I, during those years. Obviously, we had a rivalry because of the rankings yeah, and sure. because of you Great know, matches too. the matches we played up against each other and how many times we played. But it was easy to go play Cliff because I knew what I was getting. You know, Ellie's one of my best friends on tour. It, it was so hard mentally to go play him. But then it was also easy because I knew how great he is. Yeah. So I knew that I couldn't just show up and, and you know, get lazy like we've yeah. done many times with different players and win matches. Yeah. You know, we wanted to beat each other and make each other better. And so it was, it was, it was super difficult mentally to play, but we had a very similar physical style. We were both, you know, reckless abandon, just aggressive. You changed a little bit towards the end, going with the slop stuff yep. and, and everything. But it was always torture playing him, you know, not, not just physically, probably just as much mentally. And, uh, you know, but it was always, it was always awesome. And I, I remember so many of our matches and our times, and, and it's why I say openly and publicly that John Ellis is, is in my top five greatest racquetball players of all time. And when I say that, what I mean is, you know, take paper aside and throw it out. I say, give somebody a racket and a ball, they're gonna play their best racquetball. And you know, it's, it's, it's the sp um, Space Jam concept. Aliens come down, I need your five best racquetball players right now and we're gonna play. He's one of my five. And uh, I can say that because I played every single one of them, you know, probably the top 15 or 20 that I've been on the court with. Yeah. He's in my top five, I don't care how many, you know, how many year-end number ones you do or don't have, how many tournaments you do or don't have. Um, you know, he also played in, a, in an, a brutal era that, how many times did you finish number three? I think four or five, something like that. You know, Jason, ask anybody. Jason ask four, any, and we flip-flopped a couple times right there at three and four with Jason as well. You know, ask any historian, um, you know, you hear it today with Rocky, how, you know, oh, could he have been number one 15 years if Kane wasn't yeah, there? Sure. You know, uh, John Ellis is, is just- You're picking him to go to war. Hundred percent. Yeah, top five, no problem. Yeah, we had an interesting match. Uh, you know, both of us come from injuries at, occasionally and had to come back, and now we're playing each other later in our careers in the round of 16s. I think you were hurt one time. We're playing in New Orleans, and I think I got the match. And it was a round of 16, and we, we lost it. Normally, we had not friendly matches, of course, but we weren't on each other verbally, negatively. Like you had to deal with with Jason. Sure. <laughs> Jason was telling me every negative thing about myself <laughs> the whole time every match I played him. Um, he, he wasn't soft and cuddly. No, he was no. mean on the court for sure. But uh, you know, you love it for that too when you look back at it because it makes you go through things you know that are tough. Thicken the skin of, up a little. Yeah, you know, yeah, thicken it up exactly. So Edzie and I had a moment where we, <laughs> New Orleans, where we were serving lobsters to each other and we each reverse pinch at each other's legs. Five shots cooler. in a row. I think I got you three times and you got me twice and called a timeout. And I'm down and I'm sitting on my there. I'm like, holy shit. So, you know, I mean, he's hitting the ball harder than anybody in the world at the time with his backhand, especially. And I'm like, I just got hit twice by him and it hurt a lot. And at the <laughs> same time, I'm hitting him on purpose back. And I'm like, oh my God, this is nuts. I go, I look over at Sudsy and his eyes are looking at me like this. He's like, like, you know, crazy. I'm like, you know, let's just chill here. <laughs> let's chill. Let's stop doing this here. We're going to be all jacked up. We keep doing this. And, you know, that was, a, that was a weird moment. But one I like to talk about because, you know, nobody wants to hit anybody nowadays. Everyone's holding up their hand. and not want, We were literally trying to hit each other with these balls. And serving lobsters the very next serve going, you're not going to hit me again, are you? And so that happened like five rallies. Too. I'm still respecting it was each it was, other it was crazy. as competitors. It was a crazy moment. Um, you know, later on in the career, I, got, I, I was injured and had to come back. Next thing you know, I'm running him uh, while he's number one or two in the world at that time, probably number one, and I'm having to play him in the round of 16s and had a couple of five-game losses to you. Stockton and Denver stand out like, damn it, I'm close, but I'm running into Sudsy in the 16s here, and this is a very difficult draw. And so I had some moments like that early on with Cliff, mm -hmm. getting injured a couple times and having to come back into these top two player matchups early in the tournament. So you never know what could have happened from mm -hmm. that point on. Um, but, you know, there's, there's crazy matches along the way the whole time. And so um, uh, if I were to say my best pro wins are those two tournaments where you beat the number one and two in the same time. And not just that ranking, but those two guys, it's hard to, not many, I don't know how many people can say they've done that. And Jason. Yeah. Jason and I, I think are the only ones. So that, you know, that's great. So when, as we wind down the pro career, when was that? time in your life or your career when you decided this is it 
Yeah. Like Mike, you mentioned Mike Young. This is my last event. I mean, yeah, I never really. I'm not retired just because I'm going to the Hall of Fame. I might just do. <laughs> I might play pro racquetball in ten years, I like, like Ruben did. Good answer. You know, when my kids are now grown ups and on their own, not living at home anymore. Maybe Jen and I'll travel the tour and wherever that may be at the time and play some stops here and there. Even if I have to swing a forehand, underhand, I'll never say I'm retired. There's no point in doing that in racquetball. I'm never going to put like my that. shoes in the middle of the court or any crap like that. It's not happening. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know when I when I knew it was over having. My second child, I knew it was coming to, it was done then. When, I, when, Julie, when Jennifer and I had Julius, I knew it was slowing down. I was dealing with a really bad right shoulder injury. I have no cartilage left in my right shoulder. My labrum cartilage is gone, so I couldn't play the same anymore. Mm -hmm. And it was only starting, you know, getting worse with, with each month. Um, but once we had Jordan, that was it. You can't leave your wife at home with two children. Mm -hmm. And um, I was happy to be done at that point. And no, I don't miss playing pro racquetball um, any more than I miss playing racquetball the way I could play. So whether it's at home or traveling to play pro stops, if I could swing a forehand, I would have played this tournament. But because I, because I can't swing a forehand, none of you all are ever going to see me play unless you come to Stockton or the NorCal region occasionally <laughs> because I'm just not going to get on video and, and have people think about that <laughs> forehand compared to what my forehand was before because, quite frankly, I tried to hit the shit out of the ball, man. And uh, I prided myself in being five foot five, only 160 pounds, 170 pounds maybe at my heaviest. And having people remember that dude hit the ball harder than most anybody I've ever seen, if not anybody. And I like that. I like that feature. Uh, I learned how to play racquetball the right way, in my opinion, after my pro career. So I was smarter and more prepared to play pro, pro racquetball when I was done. Mm -hmm. And so that's unfortunate. I didn't let it sink into me true. the things I needed to do to maybe win a few more matches, but um, that's okay. You know, I, I can live with that as well. Um, I have some losses against players that I have no business having losses, but, but I'm, I'm, pro I'm happy for them, you know, sure. like that's okay I'm too not. because, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, where, that's where that little difference of personality is right there, right? Um, it doesn't drive me nuts, you know. Uh, I, can, I can live with that as well. Everything's fine for me when it comes to racquetball, essentially. This is a nice culminating moment. And I, you might not find me running another racquetball tournament like I am this weekend. I think I wanted to do it for Adam and Bobby because I've known them both since they were little kids. Sure. And so uh, I'm happy to have done it. I have a crew and Steve and Jasmine that are willing to take time to do it. But I doubt I'll be doing this next year. And I know this event will happen next year. So I'm hoping that a group, a, a, a tournament directing staff wants to jump into that situation. Leo, you would be a great fit for that. And maybe, maybe that'll be you. Um, but this is a cool event. Yeah, it is. They did it. You know, I can't say enough about that. They did it. I think, Gan I think uh, Adam has a chance to be like, you know, a 50% of what Ganim was. He's got to work towards Ganim that 2. still. 0. And I'll, I'm, I've told him some things about that, what we see as players. When we walked into the first U.S. Open meeting, it felt like we were professional racquetball players. And it was incredible getting keys to a Toyota car, um, getting a Nabisco box of goodies that was not little, giant box of goodies that was awesome. Um, it just felt so special, and Doug Gannon was a really special person to be able to pull that off for as long as he did. Mm -hmm. I'm really appreciative to the companies that I played for. I'll say this now, though, and I'll probably say it later. Um, you know, when you're done playing and you don't really need rackets and you don't need as much product, that's great. Uh, but the company that wants to take care of you at that point, when you're not as important of a pro racquetball player when you've been there, I respect that a lot. And I think Gearbox makes the best product in the world. And um, I, I appreciate Raphael and Joel for wanting to just make sure I have some stuff. I don't ask for much. Um, you know, obviously I play a lot of pickleball, and so I love the Gearbox product for that. And so, um, but that's you know, I'll mention that today. That uh, when when you're down or you're done, the company that takes care of you, that's pretty cool. And so that's what they are for me. You know, I really appreciate that. But I I I, I didn't jump around a lot, but sure. I ended up because I've been here for so long. I ended up with you know, Richcraft, uh, Pro Kennex. Yeah, well, I started with Ectalon, but didn't, couldn't get sponsored back in the day. Mm -hmm. Richcraft, Pro Kennex, went, uh, went to Ectalon, had a nice run, thanks to Scott Winters. Yes. Uh, came over to Head at the right time, and uh, was fun to be a part of the Head family, which you, you know, you're always gonna be, you know, one of the main people uh, in the Head brand. And, um, you know, so I ended up jumping around a little bit, but in the end, I'm really happy that I'm using Gearbox product, and uh, I just really like the company. John, thank you for, you know, summarizing every bit of that. I mean, we could sit here and talk for hours, yeah, as, sure. as Sud said, but um, 
you know, before we let you go, um, you know, here in the next few minutes here, you're going to be back out on this court uh, accepting your Hall of Fame induction award that you, uh, you know, you deserve. Uh, and it's, you're going to have your family here. You know, uh, uh, Dave is already here, Pat, uh, Julius, Jordan, Jen, everyone's going to be here, all your friends. Two things. First of all, what are you going to, what are you going to remember the most? Um, about everything that you've told us in racquetball, what it's done for you. You know, we haven't even had time to talk about Julius playing. Yeah. And, you know, what do you, what does racquetball mean to you? you? Know, what has it given to you? The best thing that you remember is the relationships you build. And, and in a weird way, the thousands of people that you talk to, even if you don't remember them, just the knowledge that you had those conversations. But the, the special relationships that you may not even know each other that well, but you know each other because of the sport and you're, you're tighter because of that. So that's, that's the most, that's the number one thing for me. Uh, I'd say right alongside that, just the concept that I'm a pretty damn good athlete and that I played this game at a high level. A little emotional, I don't know why. But, um, you know, my dad loved racquetball, so it was, a lot of it was for him. I loved other sports equally as much as racquetball, so, you know, I wanted to do other things, but I'm happy he kept me in this one. And, uh, you know, when, you, when you're at 12 years old and you know you're going to play pro racquetball, that's crazy. And so uh, I'm glad I was able to fulfill and play a career of pro racquetball and meet the people I did, go to the places I went to, have some wins, be able to qualify for the Hall of Fame. Didn't know what that was, didn't know what that really meant. Never thought about it once in my playing career. For the record, I think Tim Doyle and, and, and uh, Drew Kochstick should have been in before me. And I hope somebody nominates them, if not myself. I think you can now. Because, yeah, maybe so, but I think, I think those guys deserve it before me. They were ranked higher than me, they won stops. They were older than me, but um, I'm appreciative to Robbie Partovich and Mike Ceresia for being the ones who attempted and then with Mike succeeding and getting me uh, nominated because you can't get in unless someone nominates you. That's the reality, everybody. We could want Tim Doyle in as much as possible mm -hmm. but until someone nominates him. Mm -hmm. And that's that. And, and in the end, I'll, you know, I, respectfully, it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to me. But because all the other things matter. Like I said, the losses are what I remember. But, you know, it's nice. It matters to my parents a lot. I get to say it. I get to say it forever. So that's cool, too, right? So, you know. Don't know why my voice breaks up like this. I really don't feel this emotion that you hear quite as much, but uh, it's hard not to. When you're halfway through life or more than halfway through, hey, that's reality, right? So this voice sucks right now. I hope I don't do this later on, but I think I will. You will. So right. uh, maybe I'll calm down and try not to do that later on. But thanks for this moment. This was fun, more fun than I thought I was going to have. I was obviously <laughs> pushing you guys away from this because I don't like talking about this stuff that much, you know. I do with, with my people in my hometown that I'm with around every day. I talk a lot, plenty of shit in those moments and bring this a little bit of this stuff up. But it's fun. You know, we talk about it over the years, Suds and, and Leo. Uh, you know, you guys are doing great. Uh, picking up where we, what we started with, uh, with the show during COVID, which was a lot of fun. Leo jumping in and, and taking, up, taking my spot and rolling with it and doing even better. And... Um, and it's cool that you guys have kept this going and keep that going because I think it's really important. I'll join you for some shows in the future here. You know I want to do the Scott Oliver, Jerry Price we'll do show. And, and so we'll do that at some point. But um, I'm proud of, of having kids that enjoy sports and racquetball. My son is a pretty good racquetball player. Got a chance to play you. Yes, he is. And so and GP. So I'm, I'm proud of that moment. And, um, you know, life's great. Life's great. My wife will be here today. And not that she cares a ton about this stuff. <laughs> You know, I didn't find a racquetball wife, which I'm happy about that. You know, it, it's, Understood. we have, we have, she knows it was my world and she respects that a lot and loves it and loves what I was. And maybe she was even attracted to that concept earlier, but you know, we had, we, we came together in a more organic way, not in a racquetball environment, which I think I needed in my life. So I'm really happy with my, with my life right now. He said he kept pushing us away to do this, but it was important for you to do this. Why was it so important for you to do this? I don't know if I'm going to be able him. to say this, buddy. I don't know if I can get through this talking about getting choked up. You know, Ellie's one of my best friends and in, in, uh, in life, and that's what racquetball does. You know, it's those relationships. And uh, here we are. You know, 
this many years later, and this is well deserved, much deserved, and you know I'm just so happy you're in that club, and another thing we can share together publicly. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's, you know, you're, you're just, you're still, he's just so humble. You know, you listen to that, everything he just talked about, and it was never about him. And, and I wanted him to have that moment. So, Thank you. Get Appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, it'll be great. It'll yeah, be great. Super important for, uh, you know, for you guys to see and hear this because you don't know. Like we said, we, you know, if you if you have those Pan Am videos, uh, I know that would mean the world to not only him, but his family, you know. Um, so share those special moments if you have them out there. Um, let's wrap it up, man. Yeah. What, 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 would you, what would you like to end on? No, I think we need to wrap it up because there's going to be a great match coming up here with Conrado and De La Rosa in the finals. You know, they're two great players that should be having a great rivalry for the next several years at minimum. Um, we've seen the evolution of racquetball go from the United States and Canada to Latin America to Central and South America. And um, I think we had a lot to do with that. I think them seeing us playing along with a lot of others that came before us have a ton to do with that. And uh, so I'm really proud of that fact. I'm half Mexican, so seeing Mexico be the country that it is in racquetball, that's, that makes me proud, makes me happy. And uh, just wish everyone the best. Before we go, Ellie, last words. You, you know, be proud today, buddy. This is a, you know, it's, it's a good moment. It's yours forever. Nobody can ever take that. You earned it. Uh, I know how much it means to, to dad and, and, you know, mom, and, and, but it's, it's your moment, you know, this yeah. is, you did this, and uh, be proud, enjoy it, and uh, yeah, welcome to the club, buddy, I love you. Thank you, Congrats, you too, bud, man. thank you. Fun Congrats. times. Great fun. Thank Thanks, you, Leo. Leo. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. <laughs> that was fun, guys. I thank could, you. I talk right now. Yeah.